Thank you for coming today. A couple of things. Uh, I'm a little bit outside my comfort zone in the fact of normally I don't record myself like this. I just record in the classroom or in my office. And I have a frame I need to stay within to make it for the video. So normally I'm a, I'm a big mover. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> so if I look a little stiff, that's why I, I, I'm, I have to stay in a certain realm. The other part of that is um, I, I just ask that you be a fairly good audience, I guess, for lack of anything else. I mean, I want you to ask questions if you have them, all those kinds of things. I'm not going to call you by name. I'll just call you by your shirt or something. But um, I'm a bit of an attention hog. And what I mean by that is I'm highly distracted. So I, I love Christy, uh, Instructor Tid's line, which is like a squirrel, you know. <gasps> so if you have something going on, you're checking your peeps on your phone or something, like, whoop, whoop, and that's gonna distract me from my message or my talk or my, or my pearls of wisdom that I wanna share with you. Right, so all I ask is be kind to an old lady and don't distract me, that's all. Questions are good, you know, feel free to interrupt if you want me to elaborate on something. But our time here together is really talking about uh, how to study more efficiently or effectively. And part of that is talking about how memory works because you can't do anything without memory, nothing. So you need memory. And when I was in college, I never knew how memory worked. It was just something in my brain, right? So we're going to talk about that a little bit, prefacing to into doing some things more effectively for studying with your memory. Um, how many of you right now, like right now, are you feeling like you're on information overload? Nobody? Oh, a couple of us, yeah. New students are given a lot of information in a short amount of time. So just think about all the things that you have to, that you, that you, been informed of in the last week or two since you started college. So things like where to go, locations for things. Does everybody know all the locations for all the classes? But think about those first couple days. Did you know where everything was? You probably, no, I had to find them, right? Um, so the brain, there are five pathways to the brain. Does anybody know what they are? Give me a shout out. What do you think? Five pathways. Your brain gets information five ways. Give me a shot. I got a Snickers on the line, man. I got Snickers I'm throwing out. Go for it, Black black Pope. Visuals, one. are you ready? Heads up, I'm gonna throw at you. Woo-hoo! So, yeah, Visuals, one. Has anybody got another one? Go for it. Okay, well, you get, the, you get the Snickers. You ready? Give me another one. There's more than two. Visual auditory I've got. Um, almost so close. That's a strategy. That's an encoding you can do. But how does the brain get information? Taste. Say again. Taste. Yeah. Okay. Through the mouth. Yeah. Taste buds. Any other one? Ooh, sorry. I just wheeled that baby at you. Go for it. Like yeah. Touch. Ready? Heads up. I'm not a good thrower. I would never have made the woman's world softball team. Okay. So five senses. What do we have? We have visual, auditory, taste. We have touch. There's one more. Yeah, olfactory. Very good. Okay. So your brain gets five pathways, and that's called sensory input. Think about all the things that's coming through your brain in the last couple weeks as a new college student. Five different uh, pathways, and all of those pathways are getting or giving information to the brain. So you not only have to figure out where locations are, times, you're seeing information that needs to get processed to the brain, and hearing information, you're smelling, you're like, what's that smell? That's nature. For some of us who have not uh, spent a lot of time in nature, in the woods, right? We have a beautiful campus, you're getting all this thing. Your brain is getting inundated with information all the time through the five senses. So the brain gets information and it puts it, it's a temporary storage, it's working memory. So it goes to working memory, which is temporary, it's finite, okay? And then in order to get to long-term memory, it has to be encoded. So it has to do something with that information. Working memory is temporary. It goes there, and if it doesn't get encoded, it's gone. So encoding has to happen to get to long-term memory. Why do you want long-term memory? Long-term memory is semi-permanent. That's where retrieval comes from. That's where you get it back when you want it. So if you want something, information, more than right now, longer, farther in the future, you need to get it into long-term memory. Now, long-term memory is semi-permanent. 
And there are three types of long-term memory, episodic, procedural, and semantic. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, the focus of this is going to be on semantic. Semantic is uh, things like facts, figures, core, those. Procedural is exactly what it sounds like. Procedures, how to do something. You know, when you learn to tie your shoes, learn to ride a bike, those kinds of things. Episodic are episodes from your life. That's why you remember life events. Those kind of naturally get encoded by the body. Semantic information does not naturally occur. So if you don't encode it, it won't get into long-term memory. And then of course, in the college arena, it's all about that type of information, right? You're getting things like facts, figures, and, and you have to learn different techniques, all those kinds of things. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit and just give you some information about memory. Some you may know, some you may not be aware of. Um, because the core to knowing what is going to be effective or efficient is you, you need to know how memory works, right? So the first thing I want to know is working memory only lasts a very, information there a very, very short amount of time. Again, Snickers on the line. Estimate how long does information hang in working memory? Go for it. Yeah, seconds or minutes, ready? Woo, oh, I'm getting better, right? So it lasts seconds or minutes. So literally when you get information, memory's not stable, by the way, it erodes. And it's not gonna be the same now as in the future. There'll be less of it in the future. And the farther out you get, the more breakdown that happens. But working memory's super short. That's why when you get information in your classes, you're being given information, Literally, by the time you're walking out the door and down the hall, it's starting to break down, okay? So that's why even if you pay attention in class, you will not remember everything in class, right? That's why you take notes, you, you write those things down. The other thing I want you to understand about memory is information has to be encoded, either consciously or unconsciously, to get into long-term. So if it's not encoded, it doesn't get into long-term. So like I said, procedural and episodic, the body has some natural things that it encodes with it, but with semantic information, it's not natural. You have to consciously do something with it. So think about consciously. What does that mean? Consciously. Say again. Somebody said it. Well, you're awake. Uh, that's half, but that's not Snickers worthy. Go for it. Yeah, you have to intentionally, that means you gotta know you're doing something, right? Intentionally, are you ready, heads up? I'm gonna throw at you. Wow, oh, you're just a really good catcher. So you have to consciously do something. If you don't consciously, actively, intentionally do something to encode, encode that information, it's not gonna get in long-term memory, okay? And what's our goal? Our goal is long-term memory, right? Because that's where retrieval comes from. You wanna, Get it into long-term memory so you can get it back when you want it, right? So we're gonna talk about, just a minute, memory in the brain. How does memory work in the brain? Where is it in the brain? Where is it stored? Those kinds of things. So memory in the brain, and I'm looking at my notes to make sure I don't forget anything. You know how that is. I'm an old lady, I forget a lot, okay? So the first thing I want you to know is memory's not stored in one piece. That's a myth. So we talk in myths all the time, and what I mean by is, when we say phrasing like, I need to get that out of my memory, like you are retrieving one thing. That's not the way memory works. What happens is it's stored in little tiny pieces all over the brain. So when you are trying to quote unquote retrieve information from long-term memory, really what you're doing, the memory is reassembling it like a puzzle. It's got to put all those pieces together to get what you want. And like a puzzle, it is not a perfect picture, not a perfect thing, there's lines, but you can tell what it is, right? So when you think of memory, think of it as like a puzzle pieces all over your brain. And when you're retrieving, it's working on putting those pieces back together. So for retrieval you can, or recall, you can have what you wanna have. Good so far? Too fast, too slow. Too loud, too soft. See, I'm like all stiff, I'm standing here. Normally I'd be like in your face and like over here. Yeah, question. No, I cannot. Wow, great question. I know. Apparently my face on it, oh I can, I'm being told I can move it, my bad. 
Is it just like click, drag, drop? Yeah. Okay. We're gonna give it a shot. No, that's awesome. Where do you? Where is it gonna be less? Ooh, look at that. Learn something new today. Bottom right, right here. Is that less distracting for you? It did on my screen. So we have. We just happen to have uh, tech support here today. Um, so if you want to guide me, it moved on my screen. I don't know if you want to guide me or not. Okay. So we're gonna have a guest IT specialist today uh, who is fantastic. If you don't know who the instructor is, you need to. Um, we call him Superman, Superman behind his back. So you remember what I said about the squirrel distracted? Yeah, this is a really good uh, indication of that. So one of the core things about memory I want you to really realize is you cannot remember something you don't understand. You got no shot at going into long-term memory if you don't, you have to understand information in order to get it into long-term memory. So the first step in any kind of encoding or any kind of work that you're doing in the college arena for your information, any class, you gotta make sure you understand it. Understanding is the first step. Without understanding, nothing else is gonna happen past that. It can't get into memory if you don't understand. Okay, now you can certainly memorize, and I'm talking like that's rote memorization. You can do rote memorization, right? But that's not what college is about. College is not about rote memorization. And in fact, if you think you're gonna memorize your way through college, that is, that is a myth we want to get rid of right away. You can't do it. You can't memorize everything in the textbooks. You can't memorize all the information. You have to understand so that you can apply it, right? So that's what you are working on with your studying. If you're spending a lot of your time studying memorizing, you are going through the motions, but it's not gonna get you success. There are things you do have to memorize, maybe vocabulary in, in a, or terms, right? Because they might be on a test. But you need to understand what those terms mean if you're going to get them into long-term memory. Make sense so far? Okay. So let's talk about memory and attention, right? Attention is a major factor in what gets into your long-term memory and what you can process into memory, okay? So we're going to talk about two types of attention. I'm going to just introduce selective attention and divided attention, right? So selective attention is when you give full focus on one thing, right? You give total attention to something, right? Divided attention is exactly what it sounds like. It's divided amongst more than one thing. So the good news is we live in a multitasking world. Most of us, are doing more than one thing at a time. And you can do that. You're just not gonna do them well. And this is what research is telling us, that it gets into long-term, your brain likes it better. It's easier to focus in, I'm sorry, it's easier to get it into long-term memory and encode and process if you use selective attention, which means you give it your total attention. Then it will be easier for it to get into long-term. Think about in your day, how many, how many things do you give your total un, undivided attention to? Yeah, I, I struggle with this one myself, quite honestly. But then why can't you remember things? I always tell my students in class of um, when they're working on whatever, maybe they're, they gotta check with their peeps or you know, Facebook or something, whatever. And then they'll miss something in class. They caught part of it, but not all of it, right? Because they're their attention wasn't or even worse when you're in class and you're not on the phone or you're, you're in class and you're paying attention and listening and you don't remember after you left right even though you gave the full attention well how many of you have gone to class and then you paid attention you gave it the full attention in other words you were not doing other things but then an hour later you couldn't remember what was said in class or what the information was yeah. What happens? Your brain took a little vacation without you. It didn't tell you. Left your butt in that seat and the, the brain went somewhere else. Daydreaming. Maybe you're thinking about lunch. That's my favorite. I think about lunch a lot, right? Or you got to think about the other chores, right? So your brain, even though you thought you were giving it selective attention, you, you thought your brain was, no, no. Your brain said, no, I got better things to do. I'm going to go. So these are things that are happening and you have to become aware that they are happening right? So 
selective attention, giving your full attention to something and keeping your brain attended to what you're doing is what you want to, one of the things you want to work on, right? Remove things that may pull your attention. So does anybody know, just a random question, why do you take notes? Does anybody take notes in the class? I'm just really curious. So show of hands, you take notes. Okay, double snaps, everybody double snap. Good for you. Do you know why you're taking notes? Anybody? Go for it, give me a shout out. Oh, oh, oh I got a two for one special there. Go for it. I'll go you and then I'll go her. Okay, that, that's part, absolutely. Just to help, like, regurgitate what you class. Okay, so I, the notes I'm talking about is you're, you're taking notes in, for lack of a better word, in lecture, in class. Okay? Catch something you didn't get? Possibly. So you're basically you're documenting information is what you're doing. That's probably the exact read. So number one, absolutely. If you're taking notes, to capture information so that you can review it later, excellent. Yes, that's why you should be taking notes. There's another reason you should be taking notes. Yeah, that's the other one. It forces your brain to focus in where it needs to be, right? So as much as I would like to say every instructor is a fabulous uh, lecturer or engaging, whatever, I know there are many students that probably think me, even though I think I'm wonderful. Ah, uh, she's a bit of a snooze fest, right? Uh, she's boring, right? So that doesn't mean you are not gonna need to know that information, right? So there are many things in life, even though you think it, it's boring at the moment, you are still gonna be accountable to know, right? So you need to keep your attention where it needs to be, and that's one purpose. So the number one purpose is absolutely documenting information that you're gonna need to go over later, but also to keep your brain focused because it wants to take a vacation all the time, especially if you think something's boring, right? Your brain naturally wants to like take a daydream, go do things, and you gotta force it back. So that's one of those things, okay? Good job. So what we're talking about today is to study effectively. Study effectively, don't just go through the motions, right? So there's nothing more frustrating then, and I talk to students all the time, they, I, I studied three hours, I studied, I, I, I really did. My first question is, what are you doing, okay? So study effectively, not just going through the motions. So some of you may have heard my story before, I always share my lawnmower story, okay? So this is a hard story for me to share and just stand still, so I'm gonna be a little bouncy on the video. So a few years back, my husband hurt his back, pretty bad, literally like he was off work, he was on a couch, he literally would lay on the couch and would, couldn't get up except to go to the restroom, to go to the bathroom, right? And so um, in our house, we're a little bit old school. Traditionally, I've always done indoor chores, you know, laundry dishes. And he does outdoor chores, which includes mowing the lawn, you know, shoveling the snow, those kinds of things, right? Well, his back's laid up. It's the middle of summer. It's July. It's hotter than Hades. But the grass still keeps growing, right? So grass has got to get mowed. So that falls to me. I have to go mow the lawn. He can't. So you have to understand my husband's a little bit, I mean, I say this nicely, but a little bit of a yard, um, I used to say yard Nazi. I don't know if that's a very nice way to say this, but oh, he is a perfectionist, right? He, our yard, yeah, I, I think he goes out and measures the blades of grass. I'm not totally sure, right? So, you know, but, but essentially, you know, he wants it done a very particular way. We have to do, follow the lines to make sure everything. So he wants me to follow those lines right up. And then we have to turn a corner a certain way. And we have to crisscross a certain way. And by the way, we have a push mower, right? Old school push mower. It's not the rider, push mower. And we have a really big yard. So when we're mowing the lawn, I'm going out to mow the lawn. We're talking like an hour and a half job. It's not like 10 minutes and done, right? So as I said, he's laid up on the couch. I have taken on the outdoor chore of mowing the lawn. I get my marching orders. He's very specific. I want you to follow those lines. Make sure you line it up so those lines are straight, right? And he even tells me following the wheel wells, you know, and I, you can see it. Okay, okay, I'm good, okay. So I get out there, like I said, it's probably 98 degrees. It is so stinking hot, but I'm gonna do it. And I'm out there and I have been out there maybe 45 minutes, almost a full hour, right? Just sweating to the oldies, right? Just hot. And all of a sudden, I, I see him hobble out on my back patio. 
And so I take out my phone. And, he, and he's yelling me, what the blankety blank do you think you're doing? Loving wife that I am, I yell back, what the blankety blank do you think I'm doing, right? I am mowing your yard, right? So he said only three words, but it made it all become clear. Blades not engaged. <laughs> so if you know anything about mowing the lawn, right? If your blade's not engaged, what are you doing? You're just riding on top of the grass, aren't you, all right? You're just pushing it up on top. I had lined up my wheel wells. I, was, I had those straight lines. I could see exactly where I was going, right? It was right, right. But I wasn't cutting anything. It wasn't engaged. So therefore, I was going through the motions. But I wasn't effective, right? So why do I tell you the story? It comes back to the brain and selective attention and getting your brain engaged where it needs to be. So the things we were talking about today are to study more effectively versus going through the motions. Does that make sense? So when I talk to students, they spend three hours studying. One of the things I find out is they've gone through the motions, but they're not getting that brain engaged. In other words, they have not engaged into uh, selective attention. So the first thing I want you to understand is reading is not studying. And what? Say what? Say it with me, everybody. Reading is not studying. So why do you read? Why do you read? In the, so let's narrow it down. You have to read chapter one in a textbook. You're going to have a test. The number one thing students tell me when they study is, oh, I read that chapter three times. Reading is not studying why do you read the chapter go for it yes that that's almost snickers worthy i'm going to go for it you're on the right track i'll give you the snickers for effort how's that so oops sorry Woo! i, I had a little power behind that one uh why do you why what's the purpose for reading go for it ding 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 you read to understand the information. That's why you're reading. You read to understand, because remember, if you back it up, you can't get anything into long-term memory. What's the first step? You gotta understand. If you don't understand it, heads up. Okay. Um, if you don't understand it, you got no shot. So you gotta make sure you are understanding the information. This is why when the instructors assign a chapter to you, you should always have read that before you go in for lecture. Never go into a lecture cold. Cold means you just walk in, you haven't read anything out of the textbook, right? And you're hearing the information for the first time. You, you, you don't even know if you understand it. Worse, a lot of times we lie to ourselves. We say, oh yeah, I understand that. How do you know you understand something or not? Shout out, that's almost two Snickers. That's two, oh, hold on, hold on. I saw a hand, but I will go with you next. You wanna try it? Okay, oh, default, default. How do you know you understand what you read? That is double snicker worthy. Good job. Ready? Heads up. Oh, sorry. One more. Maybe I'll get closer. So, you know you understand it if you can articulate it in your own words, right? So two ways to do that. When you're reading, if you can, on a separate piece of paper, write it in your own words without looking back, right? What, what is the concept that they want you to understand? Or if you can say it out loud in your own words without looking back. If you can only copy or if you're using their words, you do not have a core understanding. So you always want to make sure you understand. I, I, I give you those two methods. You should be checking while you're reading if you understand because a lot of times when you're at the end of something, you like to lie to yourself. Yeah, I understood it. So check before you're at the end. Question? Absolutely. So one of the other things is that's an active reading strategy. So again, I, I talk about this in another time. If you wanna to come to another session or, or come talk to me on my own, or on your own, that's fine too. But essentially, you wanna be actively reading to make sure you understand. Active reading is exactly what it sounds, active. It means you're doing something. You're engaging with the text. So most of us read like this. It's passive. When you read like this, 
You may or may not remember what you read and you may or may not understand it. You don't know if you understand it. A lot of times we lie to ourselves, right? So if you are actively engaged, so those are things like annotating, taking notes while you're reading, selective highlighting. I have, I have some premises with highlighting that I cover that are do's and don'ts, right? So the big thing though is I want you to understand if you're going to study effectively, reading is separate from that. Reading is done before you actually study. Study is consciously, on purpose, intentionally doing something to encode that information into long-term memory. Can't encode unless you understand it. So far, so good? Okay. So a couple of things so far that we talked about, I want to just reiterate. You need to give it your full attention, select attention, right? And remove distractors. The more you're distracted, the more divided your attention, the tougher it is to get it. Can you get things into long-term memory with divided attention? Yes. It's just harder. It takes longer. Why would you make something harder, right? It's better. It's more effective. Your brain likes it better if you give it straight attention, okay? Does anybody know, just curious, the number one distractor, number one distractor to your attention? Go for it. Phones. Yeah. Smartphones, number one distractors. And again, come take my class if you want to know stuff behind that. The other thing to study effectively is check your environment. So the first thing you check your environment is, of course, remove distractions, right? But here are some other things in your environment. You know, where are you doing your studying? When are you doing your studying? Those kinds of things, right? So remember, studying is not reading, right? Reading is not studying. We are talking about actively encoding, actively doing something with that information in the review process. So the first thing you do is check lighting. So how many of you, just curious, how many of you do your studying maybe on the bed at night and the light, the only light you have is your little laptop or whatever is on your lap while you're doing your voodoo? Some of us? Anybody? Oh, you already know what I'm going to say, right? How many of you do it on a super comfy couch? You got your laptop there in front of you. Nobody. Okay, well, either you, okay. Thank you for being honest, right? My line is you don't want to do either of those. So if you're doing it on your bed, don't do that. Don't study on your bed. Your, your brain's getting subliminal messages. It's nine night time, right? Same thing if it's a super comfy couch. Your brain works better with good lighting. You want a well-lit room. So if you're doing it in a darkened room, you're making it harder on your brain, okay? So again, I want to throw this out there because I always get students that want to argue with me. Oh, I do this all the time. No one's saying you can't. We're saying you're making it harder on yourself. So the science behind this is there's no science that says one lighting is better than another. It's just good lighting. Be well-lit. So whether it be fluorescent, outside lighting, out lighting, whatever. You just want a well-lit space. The other thing is you want to be comfortable, but not too comfortable. The more comfortable you are, the more relaxed you get, and then your brain gets those signals, it's night night time. So you want to be comfortable, but not too comfortable. And then the third thing, of course, is remove distractors and remove the number one thing that's going to distract you, which is your smartphone. So if you think out of sight, out of sound, that's a good thing. So believe it or not, the world will go on without you for one hour or, or 20 minutes or however long it is, okay? So the other thing to study effectively is use multiple pathways. Remember those five senses that we talked about, right? The five pathways to the brain. Well, two of them are pretty much out for the college arena, right? So until they invent smell vision like they do in Willy Wonka, right? smell vision um, you're not going to be able to smell your way to the information, right? The other one is if you eat your information, it will not come out the way the instructor wants. So let's not do that either, right? So now you've got visual, auditory, and you've got movement or kinetic or touch, right? So the more you can use all three pathways in your encoding, the more likely you are to get it into long-term memory and for it to stick, right? It's easier for your brain. So think about it. Use as many as you can. Hear it, see it, write it, draw it, okay? Triple, triple threat if you can do all three with your information. So when you are studying, don't just study one way. Do it more than once different ways, okay? Same information, but shake it up. When I talk about reformatting, 
This is writing and drawing. So studying effectively is not copying your notes. Copying does not take any brain power. Rewriting your notes is a good thing. Rewriting is getting to what you said, which is forcing you to think about it and put it in your own words, right? So when you reformat it, now you can reformat it in different ways. You can certainly rewrite it in another way, but you can also change the organization of it or visually. Your brain likes visuals way better than words on a page, okay? It's easier for it to process. And let me kind of give you an example of this. So here, do you see this? That's a bunch of information. What your brain sees is a bunch of words on a page, kind of blends together. So you have to kind of go to the work to figure out, organize, your brain has, it's a lot more work on your brain. Almost the exact same information in a different format. But notice the visual difference. It's easier to, number one, see, easier to organize, right? So at a glance, oh, sensory input, I, I put those together. And I have shapes, right? Now, they're not fancy shapes. They're not, you know, you don't have to be a Rembrandt to do this, but you're organizing it in a way so now when you're reviewing and studying, right? And it forces you to think about the information. How does this get reformatted in a way? And then it's easier for you to process. So I want to just show you almost the exact same information in this one as this one, but way different. And it's because of reformatting. Does that make sense? So think about that. If you can do the triple effect. I always use the story of Dr. Young. Um, Dr. Stacy Young, when she was working on her doctorate. Now, Dr. Young is lovely and physically fit. She works out. Clearly, I do not, right? But for those of you who do, here's an idea. So when she was working on her doctorate, she, like many of you, were working. I mean, she worked full-time and was going to school full-time, right? And she had to work in her studying, her review process, as much as she could whenever she could. Well, she worked out every day on a treadmill and those kinds of things. And so she would put her flashcards up on the treadmill and then say them, see them while she's moving. And she wrote them out. So she had the triple pathway going for that information. Okay. It's a triple boost. All right. Another trick to make your studying much more effective are mnemonics. If you don't know what mnemonics are, these are awesome. Mnemonics are shortcuts. I call them tips and tricks. Um, and there's different kinds. The four I want to talk about are acronyms, acrostics, rhymes, and songs, okay? So acronyms are literally letters that represent other words, right? So if you had a, a any kind of a fourth grade Michigan history teacher worth their salt, they probably taught you the acronym HOMES, H-O-M-E-S, Snickers, for anybody who knows what HOMES stands for. Go for it. It is, the Five Great Lakes, okay? Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, Superior. Sorry, ooh, wow, it came right back at me. I will try to be nicer about that. Okay, cool, basic. So another one, if you had a really good second grade science teacher, you know the acronym for the colors of the rainbow in the order they appear. They always appear in the same order. Does anybody know that one? Go for it. Yeah, Roy G. Bibb. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Fantastic. Are you ready? I'm going to give it a shot, but you want me to save it. You come get it later. Oh, she knows how bad I throw. I, I'd probably take up the head right in front of her. Um, so that's another one. Acrostics are another one. This is where you use a silly phrase, and the first letter of each word represents what you want. So if you've ever had an algebra class ever in your lifetime, you know the acrostic, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And the first letters of that, they represent the order of operations, parentheses, exponents, so on and so forth, right? Okay. Those are both very powerful. Create mnemonics for your information. You create your mnemonics for your information that you need to know. And it's, it's kind of like those icons on your desktop. Ooh, those icons, you click on that icon, it takes you directly there. That's what it does for your brain. If you have the icon, it, oh, that's the pathway for me to retrieve that information. They work really well. The trick is you gotta create your mnemonics and then, and then have them link, right? Um, two incredibly powerful mnemonics that are very underused in the college arena, but they're ironically used very heavily in elementary schools, rhymes and songs. So your brain likes rhyme, your brain likes songs, okay? Think about songs maybe you've only heard one or two times and you know a lot of the words, right? You can, 
get that tune. It doesn't take much effort because your brain naturally goes there. So turn your information into a rhyme or into a song. Now, no one says you got to be Katy Perry and, you know, woo you know, hear me roar. But uh, pick a tune that is maybe elementary that you know, Old McDonald, bingo, you know, B-I-N-G, right, okay. And put the words as the content that you need to know. And that rhythm, that song, whatever, helps get you into long term. Okay. As much as you can, make associations and connections in the real world or to why you need to know that in your career, right? So I always use uh, Instructor Ricker as my example of this in the fact of uh, whatever you're studying, if you're in the criminal justice program, uh, he, can, he can tell you how it's gonna link in the real world, either if you're gonna become a police officer or a parole officer or whatever, you know, what it is. The more you can link, make those associations, the other thing is to connect. Connect to what either you already know about something or connect to wires in your head. So for me, a very simplistic way of this is I always tell my students when I'm, I'm working on names, right? I'm almost there for all my student names. But my standard line is I always say, throw me a bone. I give them the bone. The bone is the connection in my brain to that name. I mean, it makes total nonsense to them. They think I'm wackadoodle. But if they give me the bone I tell them and they do it right, I get their name every single time because it connects in my head to something and I will know. So as much as you can make associations and connections with the information you need to know to either your world, your life, or your career, okay? And you'll have much better shot at uh, getting to lunch memory. It'll be much easier for you to process and then of course, retrieve. So far so good? Okay. More effective studying. Here are some things I talked about. It's kind of like a little recap, a little summary, right? If you want to study effectively, number one thing, read before studying. And say it with me. Reading is not studying. Make sure you use selective attention. Focus your attention. Get your brain to go where it needs to go, right? Your brain wants to take a vacation, and it won't tell you when it's leaving. So you got to do checks often to see if your brain's still there with you right? Put things in place to make sure your brain is still with you. Remove distractors, anything that might distract you, whether it be uh, family, loved ones, your BFF, or your phone. What's distracting you from the task? Sometimes it's dangerous to sit next to a buddy in class. Yeah, sometimes. I think some of you know what I'm talking about there. Uh, choose your environment wisely, right? You don't want to be too comfortable. Comfortable, but not too comfortable. Good lighting, right? Although we are all tempted to do it on our bed or do it maybe on the couches, uh, it's not always the best. So choose your environment wisely. And then as much as you can, use multiple pathways when you're encoding. Get as many pathways, visual, hear it, see it, write it, say it, all of those kinds of things. As many as you can, multiple times. And then create mnemonics. Create mnemonics. Even if there's not a mnemonic out there already existing for the information, create your own. Those are actually better anyways. Okay. And then make association connections with stuff that you already know, either in your life or in your career that you're going to be. You want to make sure you know, how is this information relevant? How can I connect it? And, and you're building that connection to bring it back in retrieval. So far so good? It's a little summary there. I do use sources, right? So as much as I would like to say I know all the stuff off the top of my head, I don't. I mean, I do now, okay, because I've been doing it for a really long time. But if you are in any kind of a college course right now, which you all are, you realize you always acknowledge sources from which you've got information. So although I did not quote anybody directly, right? These are sources uh, that I use over time that I follow. I follow Dr. Zadina, I follow Dr. Uh, Willingham. Dr. Zadina, great story behind her in the fact that she was an educator, wanted to know how the brain worked and went back and became a neuroscientist at the age of 50. So went back to school at 50, became a neuroscientist, right? And then she writes books about how the brain works. Cool beans. Uh, Dr. Willingham, he teaches at Yale or Harvard, one of those two. And he's published several times. He does a lot of online publishing in psychology. He's more psychology oriented. But I'm going to stop sharing because then I'm going to talk with you. Uh, thank you for watching. I appreciate it.